Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. And I um, and, well, would like to thank you for taking time today to be with us. I'm Dr. Carol Geffner. I'm the faculty director of the Executive Master of Leadership Pro, uh, excuse me, the Executive Master of Leadership at the Price School here at USC. And I am um, in a moment going to introduce each one of our panelists. I'm going to make that very brief because as you can see on the screen, there is a barcode. And if you take your camera app and scan it, you will see not only the program for today, but also the full bios of everyone um, on the panel and um, also the moderator. We, um, the purpose of today is to host an honest and transparent conversation um, that I hope will help us take one small step toward bridging the gap between the issues of social justice, policing, and the community. We have two more events coming up in um, the spring, and I'll announce that at, toward the end. Um, and I hope that, that, that you will come join us again. I think we all know that we're at an inflection point, a very serious inflection point in our society. One that demands deep systemic change and also a great deal of reflection on everybody's part. I'm grateful for the time that our panelists are taking today to have this conversation around social justice and policing. And I'm grateful to all of you for taking an hour out of your day to share your time with us. I'd like to dive right into the program. And so with that in mind, let me do a, an introduction of our panelists. And I'm going to start with Chief Michael Moore. I think most of you are familiar with the chief. He is the chief of Los Angeles Department and welcome, sir. I'd like to in, introduce Dr. Rochelle Brackney, who is the chief of the Charlottesville, Virginia uh, Police Department. Welcome and thank you for being here. And I'd also like to introduce Dr. Akhil Bashir, who is the founder and president of the Professional Community Intervention Institute. I have to tell you, I had to go over that quite a, quite a number of times. It is more easily known as PCITI. -I. Um, welcome and, and um, let's kick off our conversation. Um, and I'm going to ask Chief Moore to respond to this first. In order to reimagine any form of law enforcement and policing, I believe we all know that we need to focus on trust, which is, at, which is the foundation. And in today's milieu, rebuilding trust is a priority. We have the challenges of increasing rates of violent crime, which you'll hear me say again, we have skepticism, cynicism about policing. Law enforcement is a very difficult um, job to fulfill. And we're all witnessing the added pressures um, on television every day. So Chief Moore, and then I'll ask the same question to each panelist. What is it that you think law enforcement and particularly LAPD can do to help rebuild trust with the community? And what are you planning to do? Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this panel. I welcome uh, Akhil and, and Chief Ragney uh, as, as partners on this engagement. And to the 337 participants and others, uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to, to step into this, uh, into this discussion. Uh, first and foremost, in building trust, it's building relationships. Uh, people that uh, trust each other, they know each other. They they believe in each other. They have confidence that uh, they have mutual interests and, and, and ambitions and goals. They also uh, are willing to forgive and recognize that people make mistakes and errors. 
Uh, truth and reconciliation is, uh, is part of trust. Uh, and, and so in building that relationship, what are our actions to accomplish that? How transparent are we in our operations so that people can see not just what Michael Moore is saying, but what is our operation and it actually manifests itself into? And also a willingness of an organization of our size to recognize we don't always get it right. And when we mess up, we got to fess up. Uh, we hire, we have, uh, we're a people business. Uh, we hire from, and we should be hiring and we should be representative of all the diversity of the people of the communities in which we serve. Uh, and when we go out and do it well, we ask that people believe in us uh, and they affirm it. And when we also do it wrong, that we own it and that we have accountability and we have the willingness to, to not only just commit to do it better, but to hold ourselves accountable. So at this moment, at this time, I think it's a willingness of us to also recognize that public safety is a shared responsibility. This is not like a parental relationship where mom and dad solve all of your problems. This isn't a society today that the health and safety of our community, all of us have a role in. And law enforcement did, uh, has played a role in some of the worst systemic issues of racism and bias and bigotry in our history. We've been the enforcer of it. But we've also, we've also led this country in regards to social reforms. We've been some of the first industry, some of the first in the profession of law enforcement, but also law enforcement in the, in the issue of labor and management to, to broaden the role and the responsibilities of women, uh, broaden and deepen and get rid of barriers involving race and, and gender and sexual orientation. We haven't got it all right, but there's also success in, in our past and a commitment going forward for LA is that we recognize that we're not done. And so it's been a process uh, this last year. We just finished our 150th year and I'll finish. 150th year as, a, as an organization, some of the best in policing and some of the worst times and some of the worst examples. And yet recognize that as we went about that, celebrating it, even within our own rank and file, we said, yeah, chief, you know, but we didn't always get it right. And so one of the things we're doing moving forward is we need to redefine our history to ensure that it's balanced and that it represents a fairness to the public that, that they see in our, exam, in our description that we are willing to build going forward by recognizing the failures of our past and not just the braggers, not just the success. Thank you. And Dr. and Chief Rackney, would, would you Thank comment you. on the same question? Thank I you. Never, I never know whether to call you doctor or doctor in chief. So I'm going, <laughs> I'm going the safe route. <laughs> Thank you. And um, good evening from the East Coast. Um, good afternoon to those of you in the West Coast. Thank you, USC and the Hispanic Police Command Officers Association um, for the invitation to participate. So rebuilding trust is a priority for many departments. Um, but what we must acknowledge first, it's difficult to formulate a plan to rebuild trust if the foundational relationship has not previously existed, right? So there's some assumptions when we say we want to rebuild trust in our communities that trust existed um, to start. We've reflected and I've reflected on these ideas of trust and um, wrestled with the concept of building trust um, with communities that have consistently borne the pain of the betrayal that we as police entities and as institutions have inflicted on them through the criminal legal system with devastating consequences um, to their social, familial, economic, and emotional wellness. Trust um, for me, and in, I mean, Charlottesville is the epicenter and started this in 2017 around these issues. Trust is a decision. Um, it must be a value aligned proposition and that our interests have to be reflected and embedded and embodied in every aspect of the work that we do, whether it's hiring, our training, our interactions, policies, our practices, um, and communications, both internally, who we often forget about, and externally to those constituents that we currently serve. Um, to build trust, we can first be, that can be achieved by engaging our communities and acknowledging, um, as Chief Moore mentioned briefly, our institutional and historical complicity for the harm and trauma and damage we've inflicted on those communities that we call to serve. Next, we must think about doing things more formalized, conducting the community forums, listening sessions, and surveys, and other communication efforts um, using 
uh, deliberative democracy pro approaches, right, to building consensus and agreed and shared upon understanding of what policing services looks like in our communities. Um, and do they meet the desires and needs of the communities? And lastly, um, we need to open up our agencies to scrutiny as part of our operational practices, um, or as part of our policies. And part of that scrutiny, we can talk about a little bit more about what are those firm action steps that you can take, but um, we must must um, avail ourselves to the public to be scrutinized um, in a way that we've not been scrutinized before. And social justice demands that of our departments, and we have to be in line with that. So we can talk a little bit later. I'm sure we'll get to those. What are those concrete steps that we can do um, as we are currently in a what I call a recognizing, reckoning, and rectifying opportunity for policing agencies across the nation? Thank you. And I'm so glad you also mentioned that building trust is for internal as well as external constituencies. Um, Dr. Bashir, your points of view on this. Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be amongst all of you who I know doing outstanding work. Uh, also, for those listening, uh, uh, we are honored for you to listen to the few words we bring to the table. Uh, where I would start with trust, as I wouldn't start with trust. I think trust is part of a continuum that we have to embrace. First and foremost, you'll never get trust without fundamental respect. So if I look at you and I engage you and I deal you, before I even get to where trust lies, I've got to make sure that there's some degree of respect that I have for you, because within that respect, I'm going to humanize you. If I cannot humanize you and I don't see you as an equal equivalent to what I represent, I'm never going to be able to establish trust with you. Then I have to go back, and I think we need to really refocus on the definition of safety, because within that, you'll find trust. I think we need to readjust our lens. Safety is not just the elimination of violence and crime. You know, a community where there is hope, individual well-being, recovery, uh, community infrastructure, that's truly the order of the day. So if I can see you as a part of that, if I can see you as a component that's helping to build that out, I can see that there is some caring that you have for me. I can see that there is some alignment. So regardless of the, uh, uh, the diametric opposites, at least at the end of the day, I can see that there is some value that you have for me. I can build upon that value. So first, I would say respect. Secondly, I would go to humanizing me. Uh, third, I would go to, uh, you've got to be able to engage me. You've got to see my normality. And then lastly, we can develop trust predicated on the fact that we have went through this process. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for your perspective. We're here today to talk about social justice and policing. So I'd like to turn our lens for a moment to social justice. Um, and, I, and I am gonna start with you, Chief Brackney. Um, I'd like to take a look at what social justice means to each of you. What does it look like from a law enforcement perspective? How do you think about it from a law enforcement perspective? And Dr. Bashir, when, when we get to you, it will, it will be the same question, but what does it look like at the street level? Yeah. So, Chief Brackney. So thank you for that. That's that. That's a lot. <laughs> but you know, for social justice to incur in any situation, we have to infuse compassion, empathy, our values, transparency, and benevolence into every one of our actions. Um, we must be consistent. Um, communities know when they're treated differently, and it doesn't take a study. It doesn't take a focus group, a task force, or a commission to inform black and brown communities that there are disparities in the criminal legal system as we know it today. Um, the real measure of our compassion is our, in our humanity is captured and reflected in how we respond to those who are vulnerable and suffering, right? That's the first part of it. And what does that look like in a real and authentic way? Um, it is transforming the work that we do now, shifting from law enforcement to um, policing. And previously, they were, we were called peacekeepers, right? And, and we've been changing slowly in terms of what roles and responsibilities. Um, and we have to create systems, right, in which we create an entire ecosystem of justice being infused into the, the entire system, starting with policing as an entity. For me, what does that look like in a real and practical way? 
um, you're not always able to show uh, those daily um, and everyday interactions. So for social justice, people want access to policing to see that, are we meeting their needs? And the way that I'm attempting to do that is to build trust, transparency, and reflect um, a movement from what I'm calling procedural policing to procedural justice in policing. And that is helping us to shape our policies and our practices um, in a very real way as we try and dismantle, you know, a socialization of blue culture um, into policing. Um, an example of how that looks in a real and practical terms, I've hired what is called a Fourth Amendment analyst here in Charlottesville, whose sole job and sole position is to look at every investigative detention, some people call it stop and frisk, um, that are officer initiated across the Charlottesville Police Department. And we dig deep into each and every one of those. The initial reason for the stop, um, the legal outcome of the stop, the race and gender of the officer, the race and gender of the person who was stopped, in, including the community they were stopped in. And we post all of that on our website. You can go and look every day to see whether it was officer initiated or a 911 driven call. And then you can start to break down the data in a way that the community can understand. I give access by um, our internal affairs complaint. We post every internal affairs complaint that comes into the department, even the ones we generate internally on a website. The date it came in, the date we completed that, a summary of the complaint, a, the outcome, the race and gender of the complainant and the officer, um, and the disposition. And then this year, I'm adding another column to that called corrective action. So what did we do in response to an outcome with some of these complaints? Our use of force, everyone is posted on our website, including a summary of the use of force, not just that we used it, a summary the highest level, race and gender of the officer and race and gender of the person who was subjected to those force. You need to start putting as much data out on your website so that people can decide whether they want a relationship with you that builds trust and allows you to build a system in which you can engage with them. So, so this is really fascinating. I hope we can come back to that um, in our conversation uh, because I'm really interested in not just the position that you've hired, but you know, in a, from a systems point of view, how you're deploying resources or, or redeploying resources so that you have the time and resources to post all that information. That's really excellent. Chief Moore, what does social justice look like um, and how do you define it and what do you, how do you implement it? What are some of the actionable steps in Los Angeles? Los Angeles, social justice means fairness. To me, it means it was commented by Chief Brackney, uh, this concept called procedural justice. And procedural justice, so I'll, I'll capitalize Dr. Giffner on what your remarks are, it's inside and outside. If people inside the organization sense a sense of fairness, that they have a voice, that they're gonna be treated fairly, uh, that they, they can have an influence or an impact on, on their lives and on the outcomes, then they're ten they tend to act similarly in the field when they have uh, community encounters. So we've focused in the last 10 years in our reforms and transparency by bringing out uses of force. Uh, uh, you know, how many, we have a, an annual report on, on the use of force in Los Angeles Police Department. We chrono each use of force in uh, deadly force and, and any categoricals or hospitalizations. Uh, what was the facts, what the outcomes, uh, the breakdown demographically, uh, how they were adjudicated, which is a transparency issue, which is meant to give some social justice for people understanding what is actually occurring. Uh, but we also do that with complaints and we do this with their crime stats. And it's so our LAPD online, our direct people too, it's a wealth of information and resources as a means of gaining awareness about how we go about work. What we focused on in the last five years in building social justice was recognizing that the means of which the strategies we use, both strategically, as well as at the individual stop level, speaks about systemic bias and implicit bias that can occur within an organization of how do you improve uh, when you have an, an increase in violent crime? What are your strategies that you're doing and engaging in with the community or not that demonstrates a procedural justice, a fairness, giving voice to that community? What are you doing with the individual level when they do a vehicle stop as Chief Brackney indicated as to was that a lawful stop? Was it not just constitutional, 
and maybe it was pretextual, but did the violator, the person who was stopped, the individual who was being questioned, feel that they were being treated fairly? And was the engagement back and forth uh, respectful? And did the person when they left understand that may not have agreed with the ticket or the fact that they were stopped, but they were given an understanding and an opportunity to be heard? And that the first question by the officer wasn't, are you on probation or parole? The development of body-worn video uh, and the installation of that across the entire agency in the last five years has given us also the ability for accountability. Because previously, social justice, the officer would say, I was engaged in this. And the violator would say, no, they weren't. And we couldn't resolve it. What we do today is we collect 14,000 videos a day of encounters between officers and people they come in contact with. And we have the ability to go back when a person believes that they were wrong or that they were treated unfairly or they weren't given that voice to go back and have an opportunity to actually evaluate it and see, do we have the individual's actions uh, on both sides of the camera? What were they? Were they fair? Were they just? Were they, were they appropriate? Were they consistent with our expectations? And then if they weren't, what's the consequences on the officer? But also what's the consequences in the sense of understanding what is our training and expectations? What are we measuring the success of an officer so that, that that drives that officer's performance. If we're trying to, to reduce uh, speed on a street, sometimes that means, law enfor uh, for law enforcement, that means a citation. Other times it can be done with a warning. And other times it can be done with simple presence. How are we impacting the community's interest in solving the concern about unsafe speed with the strategies we're using, with the lens that we just not bring a hammer to every problem, but from a social justice perform, we look at what other strategies that are not enforcement based or can be done in where we get compliance and we improve the condition without having to resort to the typical or traditional tools of law enforcement. So for me, lastly, when you look at where do you put your resources, to your point, are you putting them in areas of strategies that demonstrate social justice, to demonstrate a concern for a community to build trust in its in its uh, in its department, or are you doing it in a manner that well, you're going to solve crime? You're going to take all the responsibilities of public safety and you're going to be, you know, you're going to brute force it. And I think today law enforcement has, is in a much better place than where we were 20, 30 years ago, that this is a shared responsibility, which means every problem at the table is not necessarily the law enforcement to solve. It's for us to have a conversation about, challenge ourselves and find ways in which people can say fairly, this is the appropriate role. This is the appropriate uh, area of work for you. These other areas are really the responsibilities of other parts of government or a community in order to solve. So I, I believe that uh, looking at outcomes, looking at impacts of your strategies, looking at understanding that you need a wider and bigger tool belt, that there's other uh, strategies that can be done, such as pre-arrest diversion, rather than relying upon a traditional law enforcement role of a citation or an arrest, LAPD in the last 10 years our juvenile arrests are down 85%. And the reason for that is we can find alternative off ramps rather than making a physical arrest to help a young person who's, who's seeing delinquent behavior that the criminal justice system is not the solution. On traffic citations, our, our citations are down more than 50 to 60% and yet traffic safety has improved. And we believe it's because the encounter between the officer is really where the enforcement action lies, not the citation that's left. And, and gaining willing compliance and gaining uh, a, a, a compliant public that recognizes its responsibilities in public safety, that interchange is 10 times more powerful than leaving somebody with a citation uh, and, a, and, a, and a fine of hundreds of dollars and a resentment against the officer that punished them. So those are just some of the ideas that, I, that, we, that we embark on here in Los Angeles. You know, relative to that last point, I think it connects to Dr. Bashir's earlier comment around respect, because respect is built one action at a time. And so to your point, you know, if you can shift the behavior between an officer and, an, and a human, right, even, even in benign circumstances, that's part of the building block. Both of you, uh, both chiefs um, have mentioned also huge um, shifts in perspective and mindset from social, from policing to procedural justice. And I wish we had the time to really dig down into how that goes from a vision and a concept 
to reality, but maybe that will be for another conversation. Dr. Bashir, what does social justice mean at the street level and um, what can be done? Well, I really appreciate the comments from both the chiefs and uh, I know they're very well-meaning and really try to do the best they can for these communities. I've worked with uh, Chief Moore and I can attest to that. I'll say this though, uh, we all operate from our perspectives and our perspectives are a reality. And, uh, and, and, and being true to speaking to the community, uh, the concept of social uh, justice is a myth. And let me explain why. Because when you look at our communities that are so, uh, uh, that are so fractured, when you look at the trauma that goes on in, in those communities, and that trauma is not being dealt with, uh, that, that, that crisis that uh, leads to distress, uh, that leads to the actual individual and communal trauma, when we look at the situation that going, uh, excuse me, that goes on in most marginalized communities, you have not only the inability of lack of community investment, you have structural inequality, you have systematic racism, you have interpersonal trauma and violence, you have victim services that are not being dealt with, you have development of safe spaces. So now, is it the law enforcement's uh, a continuum to deal with that, by no means. But back to what Chief Moore was talking about, which I think is a very crucial point, we have got to embrace the concept of shared safety. Shared safety means everybody in a community has the responsibility for their own safety. But if those individuals are not included in the process, if they don't have a voice in terms of helping dictate the policies that define what happens in that community, and lastly, if they're not listened to when they bring that expertise to the table, those communities are gonna be very defensive. So when we talk about uh, social justice, I really want to embrace the concept of moving past social justice to transformative justice, because in the process of transformative justice, we key in on root causes. And then from those root causes, we build out systems which change the dynamic in which these communities operate from. So I, just like I said, both the chiefs are operating from their perspective. I am also operating from my perspective. That's human behavior. Excuse me, that's human behavior. And that's why it becomes so imperative that the conversations be had to where we can value one another, not necessarily agreeing on all the concepts to be implored, but value the fact that we all should have inclusion and voice within the process that's going to dictate how these communities at the end of the day are either going to take ownership or not take ownership. So when we talk about back to that concept of social justice, most of the community wants to see things that number one, include them. Number two, address their trauma. Number three, uh, make it be known that they have a voice in the process. Number four, uh, make sure that at the end of the day, when new policies are created, uh, that they're going to be a part of those policy, uh, policies, excuse me, and those policies are gonna be reflective of their needs and not external needs that are either brought in by researchers, that are brought in by academics, academicians, excuse me, or that are brought in by others in the municipal structure who are not on the ground, feeling their pain, knowing what they go through and having to address that from the perspective of their vision. So I'd like to pick up on some of the ideas that you're talking about, Dr. Bashir, and I'd like to, to go to the responsibility, the possibilities um, at an individual level. So, so let's look at the context, the bigger context. We've got now in the public square, we have added pressures of domestic terrorism. So, you know, unfortunately, this is not going to go away, you know, January 21st. Um, that's on top of rising uh, rates of violent crime, not just in Los Angeles, but in cities across the nation, on top of all of the other challenges facing law enforcement and policing. So given the notion, the concept of shared safety, given the comments that have already been made about you know, the individual, this has to also be, um, uh, the individual also plays a role in creating a safe environment. Um, I would like to know from all of your points of view, one, what can an individual do? And two, from a systems perspective, given the reality of budget cuts, because everyone's experiencing them, and I know that this is a, a sensitive issue, but given the reality of budget cuts, how can law enforcement also help with the increasing domestic terrorism, anger, 
fear, cynicism, et cetera. So it's both. It's what can the individual do from a shared safety model and what can policing and law enforcement do within the reality of massive budget cuts. So Chief Moore, let's start with you this time. I think there's an analogy here of uh, one's personal safety, public safety uh, to health and safety. Uh, when we look at a health system, uh, whether it's our personal health or the health of society, we see that there are efforts of prevention, the investment and efforts of staying healthy, of avoiding illness, of avoiding lifestyles that, that, that uh, impact us with uh, our critical issues of longevity that jeopardize our, our existence. The same goes with public safety. There's a prevention arm of, of investing in our society. And it's not just the doctors, not just the emergency room on, on health. It's how did you get in that condition where doctors and the health system is now having to intercede on an intervention instead of prevention. And as a society, uh, we place too much responsibility on the intervention rather than on the prevention. We're not investing enough in our health uh, and our public health in the sense of our education institutions, our housing, our, our jobs, our reentry of those that, have, that have, are coming back into our society. Uh, there's just too many opportunities for us to rely upon uh, that we look to instead that we're going to arrest our way out of this. We're going to punish. We're going to use the intervention of law enforcement in place of avoiding it to begin with. Now, I will say that I'm not an or person. I'm not a binary, it's this or that. Uh, and, and we have fallen prey, uh, I think in the recent years, to becoming that. We're very, it's, a very, it's been a very divisive time and it's either you're the this or you're that. Public safety or effective social programs and, and interventions that can help restore the, the, the health of, a, of an individual and a community. Uh, both are expensive. Both need to be invested in deeply. Good policing is expensive. Good health, housing, uh, education, uh, keep, uh, bringing families together, dealing with those fa broken families are, is expensive. We as a country have not invested, for instance, in mental health right. and welfare for the last 50 years. The promise of the 60s has never been delivered. Even criminal justice reform of the last decade has not been delivered. It's, we've moved people out of incarcerated settings, but we've not seen the supportive services build at the same level of, the, of those that have been released back into what? Lack of jobs, lack of, of, of efforts to bring them back into society's mainstream, which then results in criminalizing individuals and them going back into old habits and prior uh, conduct that gets them back into the criminal justice system. Uh, if you ask yourself today, if you had a mental health episode, where would you go? We know exactly where we'd go for a fast food burger. We could, we, there's thousands of places to go for urgent care if you've got a, a, a stitch or you need something, uh, some, uh, some, something for a flu. But think about where your, lo your local mental health facility is. And think about your access to mental health. And that's with us who have the means of being a participant in a body like this. So what I say on this dilemma is that, first of all, we got to recognize as a society that we have a lot of investing we need to do, not just maintaining law enforcement, but building the other programs of this shared responsibility so that we're not so reliant on law enforcement. We have become the 911 of every societal ill because the, so the social 911 closes at five. And by the way, we're off on the weekends and we're not available during the holiday season because we're having a brunch. And, and I say that with intended sarcasm because culturally people enter in many of those disciplines without the interest of working in, in a position of outreach and engagement with those most impacted by these lack of social so systems and control. So my view on this today is now the society is in a tremendous pressure point because brought on by this pandemic, worsened by this divisiveness of left or right, but we can work through this. First of all, recognizing it. And secondly, then being willing 
to maintain public safety as it's being challenged by these resurgence because of broken institutions, while also dedicating added investments in those institutions. Right now, my greatest need is not more police officers. I want, I'm asking for us to hold what we have, but I am asking for interventionists. I am asking for people who can calm and help calm turmoil in the streets. I'm asking for jobs to be found and, and support systems for individuals who feel a sense of hopelessness. I'm not looking to enforce our way out of this pandemic. I'm looking for us to find ways to address the ills of the institutions that are breaking down and that people are now feeling a sense of hopelessness and with that, an angst and an anger and are striking out many times against each other. I think um, some of your comments actually tap right into something Chief Brackney mentioned before about a larger ecosystem um, a justice ecosystem. So Chief Brackney, let's hear from you um, about this very same question. And um, yes. So I would just shift the conversation. Um, there actually is a concept called the co-production of public safety, right? In which we actually talk about, um, it's a shared decision model system, um, which we all have authority. There's voice, there's shared ownership. Um, and responsibility and establishing how public safety looks in their communities and how those services are delivered in those communities. And there's a lot of work on um, what is called the co-production of public safety, right? The reason there's often pushback is police entities, departments don't want to share that authority, right? There's, there's often um, the assumption that if you give away authority that you lose it. In reality, it's just the opposite. We all become stronger um, when we pull those together. When you provide community members with real voice and authority, and more importantly, a shared responsibility in defining and overseeing their public safety strategies for their communities, um, it allows them for a lot of a different range of services and options to create or to deliver services. Um, it goes beyond traditional policing concepts when we talk about community policing um, as strategies um, in that we provide holistic structural approaches um, as Chief Moore was alluding to, where you have individuals um, who have expertise in dealing with whatever those social um, ills, however, that we've abandoned people from for, for, for decades and, and for dinner, generations. It allows for other professionals and experts to enter into the process and not have a sole strategy that you know lies at the feet of law enforcement. Um, you have those experts who can assist you with domestic violence, with mental health, with social services, um, and where 911 has become that is everyone says eggs in a basket, 911 is that sole egg in a basket for all of society right now. What we need to offer is um, ownership and um, mutually agreed upon ownership between what does public safety look like and how we deliver those models. And then if we force our government, local governments, federal governments, state governments um, to support the adoption of it through their funding models. Of course, that's going to go move to, well, then defund the police, right? That's typically the language you'll hear. But what I respond to people and say is, wherever those resources we would like them to go, you can fully fund a um, response team that would come out for mental health um, or those persons experiencing some sort of emotional wellness. Oftentimes, what we forget that is their capacity. So you may have resources and lack capacity to really do the work. And we don't think about that when we talk about destructuring. So often you'll hear me say, is there a way to deconstruct and to construct at the exact same time when we're looking at these issues? And that may mean tearing down and tearing apart some of these current structural systems in order to build those um, other systems in place. And for those of us from the Northeast where it's cold, um, our roads are always under construction. Um, there is always some pothole here to be filled. Um, and I liken this, this concept in the exact same way. As you're tearing up lanes A and B, you're still driving on C and D. So there is still the ability to move a system forward and build a new set of systems on firm foundations with agreed upon 
principles, um, et cetera. And the one thing we haven't talked about that we often shy away from is we have to deconstruct the culture of policing, right? As part of this epidemic that we are facing across the nation. Um, there is a culture within policing. There are articles that come out every day talking about, you know, the thin blue line and what does it mean to be indoctrinated into policing? And there is an indoctrination process. You know, I wear this uniform, but as a multi-ethnic, you know, identifying Black woman, I am influenced by the system in which I operate in on a daily basis. And that will often... Um, the lens in which I look through it, my lived and shared experiences are gonna be informed by every one of those. Um, and we need to change and foster a culture and policing where we can um, challenge our assumptions about public safety and challenge our assumptions about who um, are those, per those, those persons who um, often are at the end of our policing strategies to quote unquote, make community safer. Um, and I have some ideas about that when Chief Moore was talking about body-worn cameras. Yes, we all have body-worn cameras, but if we're only using them um, after the fact to review things and not in a very proactive way to coach our staff through incidents, it's not enough to just review incidents. Are we coaching our individuals through encounters in a way that is safe? Very similar to a Pittsburgh Steelers fan on this end of the conversation um, who would look at football films. How did we perform the last time? Isn't that safe to do that? That's actually best practice to look at your films um, for those athletes out there. We need to do that same kind of thing in policing so that we can help with our co-production and we are meeting the needs of the communities that we serve. I think you've you've just, um, with, without meaning to do so, I think you've just added- Or alienated a bunch of your population. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I spend my time working on deconstructing cultures of large complex organizations. And so I would love to come back to that topic. Um, Dr. Bashir, before we go to q and I'd like to hear your points of view also on um, this conversation. Well, first, I think we all have to realize when we talk about reimagining uh, public safety, we need to embrace the fact that it's not going to be easy. Uh, we're going to run up against obstacles. It's not going to be comfortable, and it's going to serious, seriously, excuse me, take uh, some psychological redirection on the part of certain people that are in positions of power. From the street level, we always like to say uh, we need to put the public back into public safety, and this is the concept that we stand on. So, with that being said, we see the development of a community-led uh, public safety system or strategy that works in parallel. Uh, with the uh, law enforcement entities, fire departments, et cetera. And that goes back to inclusion. And that goes also into building a community driven process to where that community takes part of that shared ownership and realize if anything is going to transpire for change in those communities, it's going to take a holistic process to get that done. When you look at the terrorism perspective, uh, look, let me be very honest. If we don't deal with our fractured communities, if we don't deal with our people that are right here inherently in our own country and make sure we meet their needs, we're going to see a much broader a degree of internal domestic terrorism because people are at wit's ends. I think this COVID-19 really brought out how much fracturing that these communities are based up against. Most of your marginalized communities, not only are they on the uh, the the, the the uh, small end of uh, economic infusion, uh, the small end of comprehensive resources that they can take ownership of that community, but they also were hit by the, uh, um, the physical situation of the COVID uh, situation. And so now you've got a tri-nexus of trauma that has to be dealt with. And when people are that traumatized, they are gonna reach out to find some degree of, of the eradication of pain because I want some type of feel good. So I might take social uh, um, constructs that are not accepted by the norm of society and, and implement those things just to give me some a realization of peace in the moment to where I can feel well, I can feel restored, and I can feel that I have some type of purpose and stability. So I think it's gonna take, a, again, a re-looking, a re-envisioning, and a re-understanding of the normalities in which people are operating from. All of us are gonna to have to step out of the narratives that we've been so inherently used to 
uh, for, for, for decades and realize, can I envision, can I look at this thing differently? And when we talk about lastly on the, on the refund, I always say it's not defunding the police department, it's refunding. It's making sure we create a better balance to where we can bring the expertise needed that's going to meet those community needs, meet the individual needs, meet the needs of our law enforcement uh, entities to where we can create at the end of the, in the, end of the day, excuse me, a win-win situation where everybody is going to benefit, they're gonna feel they have purpose and they're gonna have the uh, understanding of that responsibility and wanna take that ownership and move in the process forward. Thank you very much, all of you, um, all three of you for um, really your thoughtful comments. Clearly, you've been all doing a lot of work on this. This is not the first time. Um, I'm going to open us up now to the questions that have been coming in. And um, frankly, I'm going to just start by reading them uh, one at a time. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, and there was, um, here we go again, these are, this is random. Um, and thank you audience participants for sending in your questions. Um, this is a bit long, so let me read. Um, with procedural justice in terms of Los Angeles, do you believe that law enforcement officers are given appropriate consequences for use of force that ends in a civilian's death? There, were, there was um, significant unrest last summer with over 600 officers who have walked free. And I'm wondering why there seems to be a different definition of procedural justice for those in law enforcement versus everyday civilians. And even though this question is targeted at Los Angeles, I think both the chiefs can answer, address this. Chief Moore, would you like to start? Um, I don't quite understand the reference to 600 officers in this past summer. Uh, there's an inference there that there were 600 officers involved in the death of an individual. Uh, and so in Los Angeles, we definitely, uh, there's two, there's a couple of things. One, A, we believe that the use of force by law enforcement is one of those critical areas in building uh, and restoring trust and that we have misused force in the past. We've been over-reliant on it. We, police itself has been a force uh, to, to compel a society at times to uh, achieve the ends of a government that have been racist, that have been, had had uh, systemic issues of social injustices and police were the force. There's individual instances in which the reliance on force has been, uh, we've been over-reliant, over-reliant. We haven't considered de-escalation, other alternatives, talking things down, slowing things down. So the last five years, the organization has been bent on how do we lower the instances of force and particularly deadly force? How do we stress the need for encounters with persons experiencing mental illness to effectively de-escalate? How do we ensure that the use of force standards are reasonable and necessary, not just that it's within an allowable point, but the use of deadly force is a last resort? How do we ensure officers have tools and tactics and training that they can avoid situations escalating where they have to resort to force? And I'm proud of the outcomes. We, we look at where we're at for the number of uses of force and deadly force in Los Angeles, a city of 4 million and with more than 1.7 million encounters a year, we use deadly force 45 times in 2015. Last year, that number was 27. Uh, in the number of the 27, there were, uh, there were seven deaths. Seven deaths I want to avoid, but also we had officers in those encounters that were shot and injured and a year and a half ago killed as a result of engagement. So this is a, 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 a encounter where law enforcement coming against conflict and dealing with trying to protect people and uh, apprehend individuals have a rubrics of how do we deescalate and control for it. Now, when officers misuse force, and we judge this uh, with a forensic level of an investigation, an independent oversight by the Board of Police Commissioners, which are my boss, and they determine whether use of force is in or out of policy, then, when it's out of policy, what are the consequences? And consequences can range from a removal or termination down to something lesser than that, which includes training or a discipline. And do I believe that there's procedural justice? Inside and out, inside, yes, because I think it's transparent and the officers know that there are consequences. 
outside we need in California to change our laws. I'm prohibited by state law of talking about discipline involving officer misconduct. And that's whether it's involving an officer use of deadly force or other misconduct. And I believe that that's an injustice and it's unfair to a public as they're judging whether me as a chief are holding people accountable and the transparency of what happens when an officer misuses force, whether on purpose and, and, and willfully. Uh, and I think that there are times in which uh, there are instances where officers will resort to force at, because they're scared, they're frightened, and we later find it's out of policy because they had, they had bad tactics. But the rarity of use of force in Los Angeles is, I think, often misunderstood. And many times people ask, they think that we shoot, that our officers are using deadly force hundreds of times a year uh, in constantly engagement when it's, a, it's much, much, much more, more rarity. But yet we're, com we're committed to ensure that we reduce it to zero, if at all possible, while also recognizing the perils of a very violent society. But lastly, I'll go back to the initial point. Are people, police officers, treated the same as a citizen or community member on the street regarding the use of force? And the answer is no. And anybody who says otherwise is, 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 doesn't pay attention to the state law or the expectations of police officers. Police officers are charged with responsibilities and engage in activities that a normal, typical uh, private community member is not. Uh, they're, they're charged with, with interceding and, and affecting arrests and overcoming resistance and while also affording the rights for them to defend themselves. And in that engagement, there's a different calculus than a community member who exits their house and if decides that they're going to use deadly force on someone breaking into their car. Uh, so the, the reality or an individual uh, who is, uh, chooses in a fight to resort to deadly force in defense of themselves and that they're not serving a, a societal purpose. They're just in a fight. When law enforcement's in that fight, we expect law enforcement with training and experience to exercise greater restraint than a citizen. And we'll hold them accountable when they don't. The criminal portion of it is, but is a different scenario where it's a much more difficult engagement that I think we're now wrestling as a country. Is that bar too high or is it an appropriate spot uh, in, in, in the right level? And of course we see the death of George Floyd. We see the death of others at the police, at the hands of police. And I will not argue that there are law enforcement that were painted with a broad brush with 17,000 agencies. I'm sure Chief Crackley will agree with, would, 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 may have some sense of agreement with this, is that we are often painted on the actions of a very few have over an entire profession. Uh, in LA, we get it wrong as well. And I have fired, in my two and a half years as chief, I've, I've efforted to fire people who have had a misuse of force, who have violated the trust that we've given them, have misused force. And I think that that is procedural justice, except that in California, I can't talk about it because it's confidential, because it's a personnel matter. I'd like to see that change. Thank you. I would like to get to a couple of other questions, but Chief Brackney, let me give you a moment to also respond, and then I'll go to the next question. So I'll make this really quick so we can get um, additional questions in. So I think we're conflating procedural justice with what people want as a social justice, right? Procedural justice deals with how we all interact, the police interact with the community so that the um, outcomes and public safety are um, significantly, significantly impacted. I think there's a call for social justice and that it's an equitable and fair approach to when communities um, or persons in the community commit violent acts and when police commit violent acts, right, illegally. So that that's what I think we're attempting to balance um, here. So when it comes to police um, violence, excessive force, um, officers being charged with, with homicides and murders, what we're finding out is that we need to invest resources in the beginning in officers right from day one. Study after study has shown that officers who are, have a higher level of formal education are less likely to use force, consider other options um, because of their confidence and their other skills and abilities versus just their confidence and the weaponry that they often carry with them around um, their belts. Women are less likely to use force. 
than than men when it comes to um, deadly force. And it's typically because um, communication skills that are often honed in women, understanding that there are some, and I hope I don't get any pushback, but just physically, you know, at five foot seven, 139 pounds, my likelihood to be able to engage um, physically with somebody um, and be successful when that is going to be less. So I need to be able to use a lot of other skill sets to de-escalate, to get someone in, um, willing to go along with what um, I am asking and attempting of them to do. But there are also things that we can do, right? Although I may not be able to talk about the discipline of an officer, as I've told you, I'm posting corrective action on my internal affairs complaints, right? I'm posting my use of force scenarios, highest levels of force use. Now here's what I'm able to do with corrective action because I'm not allowed to turn about, talk about personnel I, I issues as well here. But I put a generic, what is the case number in? Um, the, um, when there's a complaint, I put a generic case number in, a generic um, entry, the date that it was entered in the system, closed the summaries and the race and gender in corrective action, right? And whether it was sustained or um, unfounded, exonerated. That is not revealing personal protected information nor anyone's personnel jacket because there is a unique identifier for each of those internal affairs cases. So I think you can show the public what you are doing um, in a way that instills confidence without violating any union contracts, police benevolent association negotiations, or um, personnel records. So we just have to be creative to give the type of transparency that is desired of us and still tell the story about the work we're doing. And that was a little bit more long-winded than I anticipated, so I apologize. But really important information because you're putting forward ways in which you're actually implementing um, strategies to increase transparency and accountability. So we are, um, I have a long list of questions that have come in and I will say to the audience, our next event is February 24th and the topic is systemic racism and the history of policing. We're gonna, uh, our team will do our best to take a look at some of the questions that have come in today to see if there's any way we, we can um, integrate uh, some of them into that discussion. We only have two more minutes and I want to give each of our panelists about 30 seconds to share a takeaway from this conversation, something that has struck you or something that you're thinking about um, or something that is important to you. So Dr. Bashir, I would like to start with you first. Well, I think the concept of deconstructing and rebuilding and uh, looking at it from a uh, different uh, point of vantage as well as uh, the component of shared safety. I think all of those uh, have to work together. Uh, and I think the inclusion of the community working in parallel uh, with our agencies to try to create the best result as, as possible uh, would be fundamentally a strong way to move forward. Thank you. Dr. Brackney, you're next. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, this is a watershed moment in policing and in our national history and our national narrative about what policing looks like in our communities. Um, I am moved by the fact that we are talking about these issues in procedural policing. And interestingly enough, not one time did we say 21st century policing concepts. Um, I think we need to really hone in on what that means in a real and practical way so that we can move forward um, on those tenants and those pillars that were built. Um, and it's going to require, again, a radical overhaul of police culture, creating an actual template for communities to create and, create and define what public safety means for them and how we all are part of that co-production. Thank you very much. And we are at 359. Chief Moore. <laughs> I want to thank the 338 participants who listened in today, uh, their questions, their comments, uh, the, the, their commitment to this issue. These are important issues in the future of this great democracy. It was once said that the, the democracy and this great government is not, it's not in our bloodline, it's not guaranteed, it's not passed from one generation to another through heredity. It's passed through hard work, dedication, and, and, and fighting for the ideals of this great union, of this great experiment. Today is an example that Americans and ready uh, for the evolution uh, of to reform our, our systems, improve our systems, and achieve justice. 
God bless you all and please stay healthy. Well, it is beyond my, thank you very much. It is beyond my wildest dreams that we actually stopped at four o'clock sharp. I want to thank our panelists again. Thank you very much. And I want to thank 340 some odd people who showed up. We had over 700 people register for today. Um, I hope you're able, I hope today was a value and I look forward to seeing many of you on February 24th. Thank you, be well, stay healthy, and we'll, we'll be back. <laughs>